Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to this Google Plus Hangout uh, for, for immediate release. I'm Shell Holtz in Concord, California, and with me is my co-host. Hi, everyone. Neville Hudson in Working March in England. And we also have with us Eric Schwartzman, uh, the uh, podcaster behind On the Record Online and a regular contributor to FIR. Uh, Eric, you were with us at uh, the hangout that we did around Le Web with Chris Hewer and Tack Anderson, and you started to tell us about your horror story uh, using Airbnb when you were in Paris for Le Web, and we wanted to uh, pick up on that and, and uh, have that discussion. So why don't you start off, Eric, telling us exactly what happened. Uh, sure. First, let me start by just telling, for those folks who don't know, what Airbnb is. Airbnb is a community marketplace where uh, people who own apartments and, and want to rent them uh, can do so over this community. So you basically list your apartment, and um, it's integrated with Facebook. So if other people have stayed there um, and they're a Facebook friend of yours, uh, you could see their thumbnail on that listing. Uh, you can leave whatever review you want. Uh, but the same is true of renters, too. Renters have profile pages. You can sync up your profile page with LinkedIn, with Facebook, with Twitter, and um, you can be reviewed by uh, owners of apartments that rent them as well. So the whole idea is you know, you're going to a city, and uh, maybe you don't want to stay in a hotel. You want to save a few bucks, or you want a kitchen, or you want a common area or a place where you can convene with a larger group. And so you decide, well, instead of staying in a hotel, why don't we rent an apartment or even a home? Um, and that's sort of the proposition of Airbnb. It's been a real internet darling. I haven't seen really any negative feedback on the service at all. And, um, and, and that's kind of what it is, just to set it up. Which I neglected to do. Uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, your experience was different than uh, what most people seem to be saying. It really was, guys. And let me just, before I sort of lay, go dig into the laundry list of things that went wrong, let me first say that I had a great time in Paris. And it did not spoil my trip. We had great, uh, I took my wife and my son. Uh, I went to Le Web uh, in the daytime and spent the evenings with my family. And I loved Paris and it was great. I just had so much fun. Also the quality of that conference is really my it's my favorite tech conference by far the level of speaker the level of, of conversation there is just at a higher level than anything else i've i've seen i mean you know i would say south by southwest is a close second but i would say it's a second um and you know i was listening actually to the most recent episode of fir what's the number of the most recent uh, well, most there? recent would be 632 yeah okay so i was listening to 632 this morning shell and you uh, mentioned that Mitch Joel always says uh, that social media is additive. Yeah, he says that it's along with and not instead of. Right. And you actually used to say, I don't know if you still say, um, you used to say social media doesn't replace mainstream media. Well, what I say, what, I, what I've always said is that new media don't kill old media. Now, that doesn't mean that the old media titles don't go away. Newspapers uh, are, are folding. Uh, but the notion of a newspaper is, is going to survive in, in some way at some level. So that's my point, is, is radio didn't die in the, in the face of television. Theater didn't die when movies came along. New media don't kill old media. Old media tend to adapt. So I think the same applies to the concept of collaborative consumption. And this is a buzzword um, that actually is behind a book that's out, and I'll read to you the Wikipedia definition for collaborative consumption. It says, the term collaborative consumption is used to describe an economic model based on sharing, swapping, bartering, trading, or renting access to products as opposed to ownership. Technology and peer communities are enabling these old market behaviors to be reinvented in ways on a scale never possible before from enormous marketplaces, such as eBay and Craigslist, to emerging sectors, such as social lending, uh, Zopa, peer-to-peer -peer travel, couch surfing and Airbnb, peer-to-peer -peer experiences, guide hop, and car sharing, zip car or peer-to-peer -peer relay runs. Uh, collaborative consumption is disrupting outdated modes of business and reinventing just what people consume 
and how they consume it. Um, and, and I guess what I kind of learned firsthand through this horror story, which I'm going to walk you through, um, is that, you know, peer-to-peer -peer markets don't always work. Mm. Um, in the book that Paul and I wrote on B2B social media, we analyzed the difference between B2B and B2C transactions. And what we found, and it probably it's certainly going to be no surprise to you guys, is that relationships are important in B2B transactions. They're not necessarily so important in B2C transactions. Um, for example, if I choose to purchase raw materials from a vendor based solely on price uh, and the qualities in f or they can't deliver on schedule, that could shut my plant down. And of course, time is money. So in B2B transactions, it's important that the customer be able to get a hold of someone to fix problems quickly. Um, in B2B transactions, the vendor remedies the problem quickly because they want the ongoing business. Um, up to now, community feedback on profile pages is what's, is what's kept buyers and sellers honest on eBay. And it, I think it works out in due time, but when response times are a factor in the success or failure of a purchase, removing the middleman who in the past provided service or managed the relationship leaves the buyer in a very difficult position, in sort of the state of limbo, particularly when the promise of repeat business is low, uh, because you know the likelihood that I'm going to rent the apartment from the same person again in the future is quite low, and the seller can very easily just post a negative review on the buyer's profile, whether it's true or not. Uh, and I think, you know, basically social media is not a winner take, it's not winner take all, and collaborative consumption, consumption works the same. Um, and I think in those markets where response times and relationships are important, I question the, the uh, validity of a service like Airbnb and others that are propping up. There's one called Uber, which is a town car service. There's another that propped up called TaskRabbit, where you can essentially get someone to perform a simple service for you. And, and so I think people are looking at, wow, look what eBay did in creating this market. Look what uh, Craigslist did in creating this market. Why don't we just do the same thing for travel? But when you look at like Tom Smith's uh, Global Web Index, where he takes a, a, re a researcher's look at what type of products and services buyers research most before they make a purchase, you find that at the top end of the scale are those products and services where relationships are important and at the bottom end of the service are impulse-based services. Now, I think what we may find is it's not so much based on price because I can certainly buy a Rolex on Craigslist for a lot of money and wait a week to receive it, but uh, when you get locked out of an apartment and it's raining outside and you're standing there with your wife and your kid and there's no one to call, it's, you know, it's a completely different story. And so now, if you want, I'll, I'm happy to, you know, recap the sort of the situation that... Uh, I, I think we just got the, the big part, right? You couldn't get in? Yeah. Well, you know, it doesn't sound like a big deal when you're browsing photos of cool places to rent. But if you're locked out and it's raining outside, where do you go? I mean, that's exactly what happened to us. Um, we rented an apartment from a guy who was a busy college professor with his own family and small children. And, uh, you know, when the lock to the apartment failed, we waited six hours to get back in. And, you know, you don't think about how important a lobby with a bathroom and a front desk is when you're staying in a hotel uh, until you get locked out and it's raining outside and you're in a dark hallway and your kid has to go to the bathroom. Let me, let me ask a question in the midst of that, Eric, uh, the, the, uh, unless you're going to come to it in a second, but six hours uh, is astounding. I mean, was that there was no response or you couldn't get hold of the guy or there was no mechanism in place? I mean, how, how, how was it so long? Okay, let me first say, I don't think the guy I rented from is a bad guy. He's a college professor. He's a busy guy. Yeah. He's trying to rent this apartment and make a few extra bucks. He's not a hospitality industry professional. Plus, he's a Parisian, and that's these are some of the most entitled people in the world. So, you know, you go into a culture like that and you expect service, you know, first of all, you know, we say it's a global village, but I think it's more like, you know, uh, you know, tribal, different tribes from different cultures getting together trying to agree to things. 
Um, you know, here I am, an American coming in with my wife and kid, expecting a level of service that I'm accustomed to, and he's a Parisian who's, you know, a tenured college professor with his own small kids. And um, let me sort of explain to you, I think, one of the reasons why it took six hours. Um, and I think this is a real shortcoming of Airbnb, because if you get locked out of a hotel room, you just go down to the front desk and get a new key. Uh, but when you're locked out of a private residence and the lock fails, you're stuck. Um, so I would say, you know, there's sort of this unspoken three-strike rule on Airbnb. Uh, when we arrived early in the morning uh, at the apartment, uh, we got the key. It was in a lockbox. We got in fine. Uh, the apartment was clean. It was a nice apartment. And uh, we wanted to jump into the shower because we arrived at like 6, 7 a.m. Uh, and uh, there was no water in the apartment. And so I looked around for a main, and I couldn't find it. And so I sent an email to the host. He responded very quickly, very politely, apologizing, said he'd deal with it. And sure enough, within an hour, uh, the water was on. Strike one. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, then we had trouble with the Internet connection. Now, you guys know, I've been blogging since 2004, podcasting since 2005. I am not an internet newbie, and I had problems with this internet connection. I could not sustain a broadband connection for the life of me. Uh, so the host tried to fix the problem remotely, uh, but he couldn't, so he came out to troubleshoot. Uh, he was late uh, on his arrival, and so we, we had concert tickets. We missed our concert. But I need broadband. You, I'm a bit, you know, I got to get business calls and be able to respond to email, so I just chalked it up to the risks of renting an apartment. Uh, when he arrived to troubleshoot the broadband, he was a PC guy. I'm a Mac guy. You know how that goes, right? He just blamed it on the Mac. And there's really nothing I can do. He, his PC was able to sustain a connection. My, my Mac was not. And so I was pretty much just out of luck. I had to basically go down to the Starbucks to check my email or to make a phone call. I missed a conference call that I needed to uh, participate in for a client. Um, and uh, But he was nice about it. He did his best to try to fix it. He couldn't fix it. And he left. Strike two. Okay. Then came the third problem with the lock failing. And you know how it works in baseball, right? We were on our way out the door for the dinner reservation. The latch wouldn't close. With a lot of huffing and puffing, I finally managed to get the left deadbolt to close by actually lifting this heavy door up in its jam because it had slipped down on the hinges, and um, and I let him know that, you know, there's a problem with the door, could you come fix it? But at that point, strike three. We had worn out our welcome, and he did not respond. I mean, he had already helped us with the water, he had already helped us with the internet, and, you know, he was a busy man. He has his own kids, he has his own things to do, so he just didn't respond when I said I had problems closing the door. Well, do you think that he was starting to see you as sort of a whiny, needy customer? Totally. Yeah. Exactly. Of course. And so, sure enough, the very next day, I came back to the apartment, and the lock failed, and I couldn't open it. I went down to the street and asked, asked you know, I had to ask probably four or five people before someone actually agreed to come up to the doorway and help me try to open it, because one guy had to lift up the door, and the other guy turned the lock. I had to take off my shirt. I'm sweating. You know, I'm trying to get this thing open, and I couldn't get it open. So then I sent an email uh, to the host saying, hey, you know, we're locked out. Um, please, you know, could you come get this, handle this by five? It was three o'clock, my wife and kid were out, and I had to meet them over at the Eiffel Tower at uh, 4 p.m. I figured, you know what, don't even tell your wife about it, because mm -hmm. she didn't want me to rent the apartment in the first place, and now she's going to find out that we're locked out, and I'm, I'm going to, you know... But you just want to go to a hotel where everything's squared <laughs> away and there's no problem? Tell your wife, just deal with it. So I sent him the, the email saying, please fix it by 5, we'll be back at 5. I show up at the Eiffel Tower to meet my wife and kid, and there's a bomb scare. And they're clearing the place out. There's thousands of people in all directions. I can't find my wife and kid. I run over to the nearest Starbucks to send an email to her saying, honey, don't go back to the apartment, whatever you do. Meet us at, maybe at the restaurant at 7 p.m. I get a response from her right away. Too late. I'm in tears. William has to go to the bathroom. 
We're in the hallway. Why did you rent this godforsaken apartment? Please, you know, help. So now it's 5 o'clock. I'm across town in a Starbucks. I've gotten this for my wife. I checked my email. The host has not responded. It's been two hours. So now I send a little bit more stern of an email saying, hey, please, we're locked out. Can we get some action here? To which he replies in about a half an hour saying, watch your tone with me. Okay, I'll do my best to get there in two hours. And now I'm thinking, okay, he's going to come here in two hours. He's not going to be able to fix the problem. We need a locksmith here. And it's just going to be a repeat of the Internet circumstances. And meanwhile, my wife and kid are waiting outside in the, in the hallway. So I send back an email saying, please, very stern, get a locksmith there immediately, exclamation point. To which he responds saying, I'll send a locksmith, but after we open the door, I'll refund you the last two nights. I want you out of the apartment tonight. Okay, so now it's nighttime, it's raining outside, I don't know where I'm going to go, all our things are in the apartment, I tell my wife, meet me at the restaurant, we meet at the restaurant, we have, you know, the one bad dinner we had, well, the food was great, actually, and the service was great, but, you know, the, the mood at the table was very solemn, and I was, you know, online trying to find a hotel, and think of where we were going to go, and then I was thinking to myself, what happens if I get back to the apartment and we're locked out, or what happens if our things are out on the street? What would we do? Would I go to the French police station? And I start to freak out, I start to panic. So I figure I better call customer service at Airbnb and let them know what's going on. So I, I go back over to Starbucks and I get on Skype and I call uh, uh, Airbnb customer support. They're very nice. They say, you know what, let me get you on the phone with the supervisor. And in the 20 minutes that I'm holding for a supervisor, I get cut off. Mm. I try again, okay? I get same thing, supervisor, hold about 15 minutes, I get cut off again. So I figure, you know what? Better just go back to the apartment and just deal with this. Uh, so the three of us go back to the apartment, and he's standing there with the locksmith. And he apologizes. He says, I'm really sorry I said you have to leave. I don't know what I was thinking. I had a bad day. You can stay. It's no problem. Uh, by the way, while you were gone, someone tried to break into the door, and the whole thing had to be has to be replaced. But they didn't get in. And I'm going to give you one night's free rent for your hardship. So I said, honey, can we just stay here? we got two nights left. Let's have a good day. Tomorrow's our anniversary. We've got a great day planned out. My wife's a great sport. She says, fine, no problem. We can just stay here. We'll just shrug it off. And we've learned our lesson. Never rent from a private owner. Only rent from an agency where they have someone dedicated to help you if there's a problem. That's our takeaway. Did you get in touch with Airbnb at any point after this to ask them about how they normally handle this sort of thing or what right. you might have so, done? Okay, so after this, I write a lengthy email. To Airbnb asking them what would happen if we were locked down on the street how do you advocate on behalf of the customer and they say you know we're ha I, I say what I'd like to do is I'd like to interview you for my podcast about it and no one will talk to me no we can't talk on the record about it we can't talk on the record about it. and they give me a $200 um, refund which is very nice they didn't have to do that. I didn't expect it. They did it. Better than but, a $200 coupon for your next stay at somebody's well, place through no, Airbnb. It could be for the next day, or I could apply it to the past one, and I applied it to the past one since I have no intention of ever subjecting myself to that misery again. Um, so they gave me the $200 credit. By the way, the credit that I got for one night from the owner, uh, he deducted the cost of the locksmith from the night's rent that he, that he boosted me. So he, you know, I paid for the, his new lock uh, from the one night's credit that he gave me. Um, but no one at Airbnb would talk to me. I guess they figured they could just sort of buy me off with the 200 bucks, which was very nice, and I do appreciate it. And they were very nice, but they were not willing to be transparent and have this discussion with me on the record. And I think, frankly, guys, I think they've just gotten a pass from all the media that's out there. Everyone's out there saying how great it is. But I don't think there's anyone who's really taken the time to sort of document what happened and put it out there like I am. But I'll bet you there's a lot more people like me out there. 
they 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 had I mean, you probably know this I man they had a severe issue what two or three months ago I think it was was it Shell where the um, uh, as a result of it I don't remember the details offhand you both might uh, a lot of publicity about it that led to them their CEO redefining their terms and conditions of service and and, and really recognizing that they do have responsibilities and this if I recall it was a, a pretty extraordinary case of somebody who yeah. rented who rented out and the people had trashed and stole their identity all their right. stuff and all that in extreme that case, hmm. in that case it was the renters that took advantage of the host right right but, but like yeah I guess the point I, I suppose thinking about that is, is uh, the whole circumstance, your tale, which is really awful, Eric, to be frank, what you had to go through. Uh, and just wondering to myself, uh, a number of things come to my mind, uh, particularly related to the specific communication element of, of why we're talking about this, uh, in terms of the due diligence that uh, a place like that uh, has. I'm not, I don't have experience of Airbnb myself. Like you, I've seen lots of talk online about Airbnb and nearly everything I've seen, if not everything, has been very positive. People are recounting great experiences. But are, are they purely the kind of a go-between or do they verify anything about the, the person you're going to do a transaction with? That's the problem. They don't. And they have no feet on the ground in any of the places where they rent. So there's really no one to advocate on behalf of the renter, right? The deal, the way that it worked, with Airbnb is I paid half the booking fee up front. If I canceled, I would be charged half the fee whether I canceled or not. But he was at liberty to say, you know, within an hour's notice, hey, you have to leave, I'll refund you the last two nights. And that doesn't seem like it's fair to me. And there's no one to advocate on behalf of the renter in that type of a situation, right? The other thing is, he, um, the amount of the apartment was $178 U.S. a night. He credited me one night and deducted $100 U.S. to cover the cost of the locks. I saw him sign the receipt with the locksmith. It was $100. So um, he took out the $100, and then on my profile, he wrote that I was you know, a terrible renter. Don't ever rent to, rent to this guy. He expects he has unrealistic expectations. And then he wrote that it cost 850 euros to fix his door. Jeez. So, you know, there's nobody to mitigate that, you know. I mean, the thing is, the idea of self-policing antibodies, I think, works fine in an environment like eBay or Craigslist when you're just purchasing a product and ongoing relationships aren't important. But when you don't have the promise of repeat business, I think, you know, greed outweighs... Uh, you know, doing the right thing in an environment like this. And I think ultimately, you know, the test will be based on just how price sensitive travelers are. Like, I'll go to Best Buy to save a hundred bucks on a TV, knowing that if I have to return the TV, I can drive back there and return it, and I have 30 days to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but when, you know, you miss your concert tickets, you miss a conference call that you needed to participate in to close a new piece of business, you miss emails that you needed to turn around to be on top of accounts that you're working on. I mean, what is the lost opportunity cost? The question is, are consumers sophisticated enough to realize that? They haven't yet in the world of consumer electronics. For example, I'm still, you know, thick enough that when I purchase a piece of consumer electronics I'm excited about, I open it up only to be saddened by the fact that the uh, an AC adapter is not interoperable and they don't have USB in there and oh my god, none of that stuff was on the box. I didn't think to look for it. The question is, will consumers actually start realizing, my gosh, I've already spent you know a lot of money getting here. I've taken time off work. I've spent money on ground transportation. I'm spending money to enjoy things. I bought tickets to things. And now my trip is a failure because I can't get into my apartment or I have no internet access. You know, if you think about it, the threshold for pain in a, with a product like travel is very low. And so, you know, if you want to be sure you're going to get Wi-Fi and you're going to be able to have water and those things, you stay in a hotel. I mean, it's just, you know, it's there, there's less margin for error there. So, so let me ask, there's uh, a, a couple issues that, that occur to me here. One, there are a number of services like this. I was listening to The Social Hour with uh, Amber MacArthur and Sarah Lacey 
they were interviewing somebody who's been uh, using a couch surfing service. So it's not just right. the apartment, it's, it's only the couch in the living room that, that you get. So uh, you've got that kind of service. Now somebody's launched one where you can uh, borrow a lawnmower from somebody in your neighborhood, find somebody who has stuff to loan uh, to other people nearby. So if you're going to launch a service like this, do you need to have the element that you find in services like, say, Orbits, where there is somebody that you can reach, you don't have to spend 20 minutes on hold, uh, and they have the ability to deal with issues on the ground, they have representatives in every major metropolitan area. It seems to me that would be economically unfeasible. That would drive the cost of offering the service to the point where you couldn't uh, make any money, uh, and it's, or it's not a viable it business. Profit. It would drive the p profit down for the person who owns the apartment. But if you look at like the prices of apartments on Airbnb, it's not that much less than renting a you know a hotel that it's worth it. I mean, I you know, the probably the difference was maybe five hundred bucks, six hundred bucks for the whole trip. But given the pain I experienced and the difficulty that I you know had to deal with with my wife, it wasn't worth it. Now, if I wasn't married, Shell. If I was, you know, a twenty-something and I had a higher tolerance for pain, you know, maybe the couch surfing thing would kind of work. You know, I get to hang out with some some new people and meet their dog, and you know, it's not going to be that big a deal that I step in dog poop out the way out the door because, you know, I didn't. I'm not wearing Mephistos, you know. I mean, you, know, you can deal with it, but I think, you know, when you're when you're traveling with a family and small children, I mean, the idea of having the apartment with the kitchen is great. But, but because, does that, does know, that mean, though, that, that, food for your kidney. But does that mean now that I mean, you should just look at these uh, you know, with, with greater circumspection and say, gee, I'm, I'm married and I have kids, uh, I really shouldn't do this? Uh, what, what's the responsibility of the no, organization I, that's... The takeaway is this, I think. If a relationship with the provider is important, Beware community marketplaces and beware collaborative consumption. If response so buyer time, beware, right? And okay. if, if response times are critical, buyer beware community marketplaces and collaborative consumption. Uh, I, I would agree with that, Eric. Definitely, that, that that's been in my mind listening to you as you're recounting this tale of your uh, poor experience in Paris. Is precisely that point. I mean, there's no Set the record straight. Yeah. A great time in Paris. It was sure, no, no. You, you mentioned that absolutely, but the um, just wondering about this. Uh, the, the concept of this is not new. Uh, I'm aware of services going back to years here in the UK for exchanging properties on holiday, for instance. But that's done through so, uh, companies who operate now online, and yeah. that is a distinct a verification. Right. If something right. goes wrong, that you have a fallback on that particular exactly. position. Right. There. So maybe in this case, we're looking at, you know, yeah, we're looking at the the, um, the evolution of something or maybe the development of a new way of offering these kinds of things that, that uses the social spaces online in particular. That is all, you know, right up to the minute. It meets the, the aspirations of people and how they kind of point and click and just kind of do all this stuff online and show up in someone's apartment. It's all cool until something goes wrong which is what well, you've experienced. Yeah, I mean, what's the difference really between this and how people regarded new media when it first you know, came about? Oh my God, new media is going to replace everything. It's the be-all, end-all, when in fact it's not. And now I think the same thing is happening with collaborative consumption. I saw at the web a lot of VCs putting a lot of money behind these types of yeah. services. Um, and I think, you know, they're totally discounting and shortchanging the fact that there's no uh, service layer there. Well, the, the, the interesting was thing early on that yeah. beauty of a service like E-Trade was that I could, you know, make the trade myself. But then the shortcoming was I had to make the trade myself. Yeah, yeah. So I had nobody watching the account for me, right? So I mean, the, the, the downside of all this, you know, empowerment technology that's out there is we have to do it, right? We're left holding the bag. Yeah, as long as you, I suppose, as long as you know exactly those circumstances, then you know what to what you can deal with and what the risks are in the calculation you're making, whether you go that way or, or pay the extra money to do the hotel. You mentioned Uber earlier, Eric, when you were first talking about this, because they were in the news over this New Year weekend, 
uh, in San Francisco. They also uh, opened up in Paris, by the way, during Le Wet. I saw Robert Scoble waxing lyrical about how amazing it was and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that happened to them this weekend is, I think, very much connected with the tale your, your youth describes, which was um, the price rose dramatically when the demand for their service was high. And I saw a post, I think it was on TechCrunch, where they described someone's experience who went 0.3 of a mile was the cab journey, and they were charged $80. And it showed the breakdown of the cost. There was like a surcharge to New Year's of 60-something bucks. And yet they weren't <laughs> told that quite clearly enough before they clicked the OK button to accept the, the contract. And so the next thing they got was a pop-up saying, thank you for your paying the 80 bucks, charge your Amex card, things like that. So the, the, the kind of service model uh, doesn't work. It was broken. The tech was working phenomenally. It was absolutely fantastic using your iPhone, but the model itself didn't work very well. They had a lot of upset customers. The CEO has been online talking about how sorry he was and they fixed it for next time. So is that therefore the risk of these new services that it's the early adopter time that you've got to troubleshoot it for them and help them figure out how to make it work properly? Is not your experience part of that perhaps? Well, you know, I mean, there's always winners and losers when new technology, you know, breaks out. And I think that's what we're going to see in, in the world of collaborative consumption, community marketplaces as well. I saw an interesting tweet from Dave McClure from 500 Startups during the web, and it was to Uber. And the tweet was, uh, at Uber, and I'll t I'm going to paraphrase it, you guys should increase your uh, estimate response times when it's raining. So it's like, you know, you, you can't automate the dispatcher. Right, right, you right. The guy whose job it is to make that happen. And unfortunately, technology just isn't, I don't think it's there yet. Will it get there? It could. But I mean, as long as you're in a position where you need to have a strong relationship with the provider, you are, you know, it's very risky. Right, to right. Use a community marketplace and buy directly from a provider with no one to advocate on your behalf if things go wrong. So, more transparency in the process is one of the things that we should be looking for as these kinds of uh, services evolve. We should be looking for improvements in the, the service layer. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we should be very, very careful when uh, opting to take advantage of some of these services. Does that pretty much sum it up? I mean, I guess it does, but I mean, there's another. Here's another thing that I didn't tell you about with the apartment. <laughs> One more thing. Okay, go on. After we got back into the apartment that night, when the lock was changed, I was like, I, I sighed relief, and I figured, okay, we're back in. It's over. My wife's cool. My husband, my son's all right. Just make it through, baby. Have a good day tomorrow. Let's get out of here. And then we went to sleep. We put our heads on the pillow and dumping techno music started upstairs, right? So then what do you do at that point? You can't call the front desk. So what I did was I had like a skull cap, you know, which kind of made me look kind of hip, which I'm not, but made me look, you know, young and hip. So I put that on and I went and knocked on the door. I don't even speak French. And I had to, you know, the woman answers the, the, the door, and there's a guy behind her, you know, with tattoos and everything. And I said as nicely as I could, you know, there's a baby downstairs. Could you please keep the music down? And sure enough, she did. She turned it down. This was a little bit. We can still hear it, but it, she did turn it down quite a bit. And I figured, you know, when I mention this story, you probably shouldn't even say that, because then people think you're a nitpicker. But think about it. Have you ever been in a hotel and had really loud noise and called the front desk? I've been in the hotel Everybody. where I was the one making the really loud noise when somebody called the front desk. Well, do you travel with earplugs? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a road warrior and you go to hotels and you've got to get sleep and get up in the morning, you travel with earplugs because you know. Um, and I do that, too. And most of the time, I just put those in rather than even make the call. But it's a different story when you've got your wife and your kid with you. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I don't see how, how there's really any way to deal with that. Because regardless of the feet on the ground or the level of support a service like Airbnb could, uh, could handle, they're never going to be able to come and mitigate problems within the apartment building. So I, I just think there's a big wild card there. And I think, you know, some customers 
are probably never going to be served by services like this. Well, I, I think there are probably things that Airbnb could do. I, I, I'm looking at, for example, when the person who owns the property is making it available and filling out a form, uh, it includes somebody in the building that you can call in the event of an emergency, uh, the, the super, uh, for lack of a, a, a better label, uh, that, that there's additional resources that they're required to list if you can't reach them and you have a problem. Uh, but I think these are steps that they won't take unless they have enough pain that they're forced to to add these elements to the service. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think, you know, um, yeah, for some types of products uh, where there's no promise of repeat business for the for the seller, I don't see what is going to keep them honest. I mean, well, you, there's the bad know, review that you would give the guy that might keep other people from renting. But he just gives me a bad review, and and mind you, this. So people ignore both of you. Guy. I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't think he's evil. I don't think he did anything wrong. We just had a a a, a, a bunch of unfortunate circumstances which lowered his patient's threshold caused him to write me off, and I had, you know, a miserable time uh, being locked out as a result. I don't think he's a bad guy. I think this could happen very easily in any situation like this where you have a buyer directly buying from a seller and no intermediary. Yep. And ultimately, greed, I mean, he's got this apartment, he's got kids, he's got a family, he's got to rent it. So he's going to, he basically, I mean, he was dishonest on his review of me, said, things about me that weren't true. He gave me a full refund for my deposit, so I left the apartment. I must have left the apartment in great shape, uh, but he said don't rent to this guy, and then he lied about the amount he paid for the lock. So, and there's, there's no and remediation there's process where you can go back and say, this is an inaccurate review. I'd like it removed or changed. There's no well, process. Well, I mean, I guess I could. I guess I, maybe I should. I don't know. I mean, mm. I feel badly that it's there, but I kind of feel like because I'm memorializing this situation, I'm pretty much a dead duck on um, on Airbnb from this point forward. So that's fine. I, I, I'd rather memorialize the situation and see if I can, you know, help the community advance its understanding of collaborative consumption and maybe, you know, make VCs think a little harder about the types of businesses they get behind than, you know, worry about just, you know, me being able to rent because I can go to a hotel or I can go to another service. Well, it's quite a story, isn't it? Uh, and I think um, it'd be interested to know what uh, viewers and listeners to this panel discussion think. Collaborative consumption, the way you described it, Eric, is it broken? Is it uh, not ready for mainstream yet? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are viewers and listeners think? Collaborative consumption is great so long as response times, right? So long as the response times are not critical. Yeah. Um, so, and so long as... Um, uh, there's some sort of, you know, if, if the response times are critical, if you need someone to act on your behalf right away, if you need to have a relationship with the seller, and if you need someone to advocate on your behalf, I would be, I would think real long and hard about using a community marketplace for, particularly for a product like travel, where you've got a limited number of hours to have fun or do what you're going to do. And, you know, you don't want to spend it troubleshooting Wi-Fi or, you know, waiting for a locksmith to show up. Agreed. Well, Eric, it's been a pleasure, as always, talking to you. And uh, thank you for, for sharing all of this and interesting thoughts. Uh, I hope uh, FIL listeners and viewers and anyone else who sees this podcast with an opinion, let us know what you think about Airbnb. If you have an experience, also collaborative consumption, be very keen to know what you think on that. So thank you, Eric. Thanks, Thanks. Eric. And if anybody has uh, any recommendations for me on what to do about the bad review on my profile, let me know. <laughs> do you think I should try to get it removed, or do I let it ride, or what do I do? And we'll let Thanks, you know Eric. what we hear. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for joining Thanks. us. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.